Well, welcome. Um, so like she said, today we're gonna be exploring the power of the voice. It's one of my favorite subjects because I've had such a very, very intense experience with my own voice. It's been a very interesting journey. Um, so that's me singing. Um, that could probably be more like the after picture. <laughs> more because um, it took me a long time to get back to being able to be on stage and feeling good in my body. Um, so she kind of gave you a little bit of in, you know, intro on me. Um, I did spend about three years working in treatment centers and before that I was at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. And then before that I did a lot of work in really intensive like psych treatment, locked units. That was a lot of what I did in New York City. Um, and so I've kind of moved more into an entrepreneurial space. Um, since then, when I got to LA, mainly because there wasn't a lot of music therapy kind of in place here. So I became this kind of like way shower and just paving and creating programs and educating and advocating. But before all that, I started off as a rapper at 16 years old. And I, and I chose hip hop because I was bullied and because I was sensitive and I was creative and no one really understood how to deal with that. I didn't know that that's what was going on. So I felt really ostracized. I felt really left out. And in the early 90s, hip hop was a voice for the voiceless. So I was able to connect to artists like MC Light and salt and Peppa, these women empowerment lyricists. And I began to write my own lyrics because it was a way for me to express without getting into fights because I was too scared to fight. I was, you know, I was like a kind of a pretty dainty girl and people would kind of want to bully me and do in these big groups and, and I had to find another way. And so I started to rhyme and then I started to battle rhyme on the playground. And that made it so that everybody stopped messing with me and I became this rapper. And so what's great is that I found this other persona. I found a way to be myself, and it was almost like having an alter ego. I don't know if anybody in here is old enough to remember Jam and the Holograms, but that was my favorite cartoon. And she had this thing where she'd touch her earring, and this you know, fairy godmother kind of would appear and it would transform into, into rock star. And that's kind of what happened with me. I got transformed into this rock star, which worked for a moment because, again, people were like nice to me, and you know, I didn't have any more bullying. But as I got older and as I got to, you know, 17 and 18, had my first record deal, and then that kind of didn't go right, and then the next record deal didn't go right, I began to accumulate creative injury, a term that I first heard Julia Cameron actually coin, right? I was young, I had one identity, to be an artist, to be on stage, to be adored, to be validated from outside. Right? That, was my, that is what became my wiring. So it became this double-edged sword in essence because one side I had found this thing that you know, rescued me, but then on the other side you know, I didn't have any sense of worth or identity independent from that thing. Mm. Right? So I had to find a way to save my own life because by the second record deal going south, I didn't want to live because if that one thing didn't happen, then I didn't feel any reason to be here. So I heard about music therapy and I was like, well, what is that? Because it sounds like something that I need, you know. And sure enough, when I got to the program and auditioned and got through those doors at NYU, it was the beginning of my path to wellness and healing. Now, of course, I had to go through a lot before that happened because subsequently, because of the pain and the suffering of identifying with something outside of myself, it kind of spiraled me into this thing with addiction and you know codependent relationships and, and it was just one big huge storm. And so this is how I came back. This was the beginning. And NYU was the beginning of me reconnecting to my own voice because I had forfeited my own voice, you know. So that's kind of the beginning part of the story. This is a great quote because it speaks to what I'm saying in terms of what happened to me. You know, it says, the voice is a light. If the light becomes dim, it has not gone out. It's there. It's the same with the voice. If it does not shine, it only means that it has not been cultivated, and you must cultivate it again, and it must shine once more. So that's great news, right? To think that, you know, you can just jumpstart this thing. It's not gone forever. 
So a little bit about music therapy. I always like to say a little something because again, it's not a household thing. And what a lot of people don't know is that it is evidence-based and there's a lot of research out there to support it in many different modalities and different um, populations. I've worked with a lot of different populations. I've worked with kids and psych, like I was saying. But across the board, it's an established healthcare profession that uses music to address physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs of individuals of all ages. And so it improves the quality of life for those who are well and at the same time uh, meets the needs of children and adults with disabilities or illnesses. So that's a little succinct definition. And then I like this quote too because it's, it kind of sums it up. Music is the language of the emotions. It can tap directly into a feeling and wanting through its nonverbal, expressive, and communicative characteristics. So among the most important themes of the world's song literature are the longing and closeness for love, right? The pervasiveness of popular tunes based on these themes in our culture suggests the universality of unfulfilled longings and unmet needs. And so th I like this quote because it kind of brings us to this intersection of how we're bombarded with this music at the same time, kind of like the double-edged sword, you know, where we're constantly being reinforced this message that love is outside. Right. And it's like, you know, certain songs like, you know, I can't breathe without you, you know, and, you know, it gets really, really intense. And we're hearing this kind of thing all the time. And so then I transfer um, into this quote, which is all about when needs and feelings remain unmet, the voice becomes stifled. It's inaudible, it's tight, tense or it's breathy and undefined or it's simply untrue. It could be lovely to listen to, but not connected to the core of a person. So in essence, a wounded person often survives by forfeiting her own voice because it's scary to sing. And we're going to get to that. Right. But especially if there are wounds there, you know, when I used to work in the psych hospitals, I would always notice that the patients never projected. They, it was always like that. Either they were talking very quietly or it was very tight. You know, either way, there was some kind of constriction happening in the voice. And that's when I began to realize that the voice was connected to the mental, emotional, psychological state. And it's, and it's affected in that kind of a way. Um, anybody ever heard a singer that sounds very pretty, but you feel nothing? Yeah. So a lot of times that's also a key, you know, where just because something sounds pretty and it's like, oh, this is a good technical singing, you know, good, this person can really hit high notes or they really can do a lot of runs, but you're not feeling anything. And it's because a lot of times people can dissociate from themselves, even singing. So it is possible to dissociate from your own voice. You can, that can definitely happen. So I like to say this too, because Big part of my whole thing was finding my own wounds around my own voice. That's what happened when I got to NYU. They just threw me into my creative injury and was like, okay, we're gonna look at this, you know? And because at first I'm like, how am I gonna be a therapist? I'm so screwed up, you know? And it's like, oh yeah, but we're gonna look at that, you know? So it was a big journey, as it still is, a big journey of examining my own wounds around singing because the body is so intimately connected to feelings, the process of singing can pose a direct threat to our defenses. So a lot of times I work with women or even men who are like professional and they're successful and they're high powered and they get in that yoga class and it's time to own and they're like, don't own. And it's not that they're not trying to own, it's just that there is no defense to singing. It goes right through. So the reason why this is good to know is because this is setting us up to explore how it's healing. Right, because if it's that intense and if it's that intimate, that means that it has some capacity to be able to connect us to something that maybe we wouldn't be able to get to so easily with just words, right? So many of us are afraid to sing, especially if we were forced to swallow painful emotions in words. And so early childhood dynamics of being made to not speak or to not have a voice in the household affects it. Um, the voice is particularly threatening for many people because it's removed, but it's intimately connected to one's breath, body, feelings, and sensations, and identity. So what I always like to say is, if somebody tells me, you suck at guitar, I'm going to be like, yeah, you're probably right. I'm not a great guitarist. It's, it's all good. You know, I may get over it. You know, I probably will. But if you tell me my singing sucks, I may never sing again. 
And I've worked with people who have had that experience where someone has told them, you can't sing. Has anyone in here ever had that experience where someone told them that? So here's how that's just totally out of whack. When a person is singing, when someone sings and you hear them sing, there's so many things going on, right? So the person's voice gets to your ear. It's a signal, right? It gets translated, goes into the brain, but it goes through your filters. So anybody who's saying you can't sing, it's through their own filters, through their own belief systems, through their own crap, through their own projections, through their own attachments. You're not getting a clear message. It's not a truth about you. But yet, we take it as truth to the point where sometimes we may take it so much as a truth that it becomes a law. And when we take something into truth that isn't necessarily true, that's based on a person's perception, it makes it the law of our life then we can actually wind up suppressing and oppressing ourselves. So that's the problem when people tell us we can't sing. It's not true. And then there's a whole thing of being tone deaf, and I don't believe in that. The whole thing that comes along with tone deafness really has to do with listening. And the ear is a muscle. And so if you are not able to sing in pitch with someone, it doesn't mean you're tone deaf. It just means that your ear is not trained to hear certain intervals, right? And just like anything else, it's a practice. So that's just some of the things that happen that, that can make us push those things down. You must sing to be found. When found, you must sing. It's just a great quote. So what's really happening when we sing? I always like to go through the anatomy because, and there are a lot of different ways people sing. Our voices are the instruments. So we're intimately connected to the source of sound. We make the music. We're immersed in the music. We are the music. We breathe deeply to sustain the tones. We create and our heart rate slows down and nervous system is calm. So it's all these things happen when we sing, right? The internally resonating vibrations of your own voice, right, which is pretty profound when you think about your healing yourself with your own voice. Break up and release blockages of energy, releasing feelings and allowing a natural flow of vitality and a state of equilibrium to return to the body. So these benefits are particularly relevant to clients who have frozen, numbed off areas in the body that hold traumatic experience. So can you imagine that if you have these parts of yourself that are kind of numb and frozen, how the sound of your own voice can begin to just slowly loosen those pieces up? It's really amazing. And so the act of singing, and I have a question that's coming up that says, what does singing have to do with intimacy? Because that's why we're here to kind of put those two things together. But the very act of singing could be considered a metaphor for intimacy and relationship because we inhale, and the air makes the tone as it passes over the vocal cords. So air is the primary thing with singing. Most people think it's about tone or pitch. It's all breathing. When you really learn the technique of singing, it's so much about breath. So when the breath comes in, it passes over the vocal cords. So every effort must be made to stay out of the way of the tone by maintaining an open throat in the yawn or laugh position and relaxed tongue, jaw, neck, and shoulders. This may sound easy, but it's really not easy in a sense that when I was learning how to sing technically and I had a great organic holistic vocal teacher who was all about grounding. And what would happen to me is my jaw would get tense. My shoulders would go up. I'd hit a high note and ah, I would, my chin. So all of these things would happen somatically that, that were involuntary. So it was how the anxiety was finding its way through my body. And so the intimacy I began to build was beginning to notice and become more mindful of when my body is getting tense and when I'm not allowing the air, allowing the air to come through, right? Okay, good, enough talking. Now we're gonna do something fun because you can't do a music thing without a something musical, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, goody. So, um, so when I used to work in the rehabs, I would always start every group with a little call and response song. And it's just so nice because it's just easy. I'm gonna sing a line and it'll just kind of resonate. And then as a group, we'll just kind of sing it back. So we're just playing, right? We're not on American Idol, thank God. <laughs> Simon Cow is not waiting outside. Never, he would never ever be anywhere where I am because I have a whole thing about, you know, criticizing the voice. So if your ego is flipping out, just tell your ego, we're playing a game, you know, and then, you know, we'll go from there. But, um, but yeah, just repeat, you know, it's just gonna be really simple. And sometimes what you can do too is just, you know, feel your feet on the earth and see if you can notice 
what it's like to just allow the air to just come through without thinking about what your sound sounds like, you know? And so we'll just take a few breaths together first, since singing is breath. beautiful voices. So what was that like to feel the vibration of your own voice in your body? Anybody want to share? So sweaty. It was lower than I thought. It was lower? Your voice? Mm. Like finding a part of myself. Mm. I haven't sung in a long time. Mm. Finding a part of yourself. I promise I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. <laughs> when is the last time that you sang, do you feel like? Mm, hard to say. I used to sing with my sisters. Uh, we used to sing Beatles songs. Wow. And then we used to sing the harmonies and stuff like that when I was a kid. Wow. That's awesome. Singing with family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and harmony is amazing. That's a whole other part of intimacy. And, and we'll, we're going to get to the group singing, you know, and what that means. But, yeah, harmony just... It's a whole other experience of being in harmony. And we're going to actually have the experience of being in harmony today. So, wow, that's great. I'm glad you got to activate that part of yourself again. Yeah. yeah. It it's always there, right? I became a drummer, and, and then I got more into that, and I was always behind the drums, and I did it. Yeah. Yeah, 
exactly. And then the other thing is too, you know, there's such a big difference between performance and singing. Yeah. You know, so performance is optional. If it's fun for you, heck yeah, go do it. You know, but just knowing that you can also have an experience with your voice that's independent from stage. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't really about the performance. Mm -hmm. It's more about the expression. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that's the best kind of performance. Yeah. I think I got this idea that I didn't really have a good voice, so I just kind of dropped it. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess what I'm getting is it's not about having a good voice. It's about having a voice. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then even, I don't know, if it's good or if it's bad, it's, you know, there's still that judgment. Not you, but just in general. We do that, right? Oh, this is a good voice, or this is a bad voice. Or realistically, I mean, there's certain voices I don't like that my friends love. So it's all so personal, you know? So there really isn't such a thing as a good voice or a bad voice, you know? There's an out-of-tune voice, but remember, that's your ears. That's not your voice, you know? So it's just, it's worth examining all of these belief systems, you know, and how we come to believe what we believe, you know. By the way, that song is uh, called Oyehea. It's reimagined. Um, the the uh, composer is Ricky Byers and Michael Beckwith. Um, and I love their music. It's really incredible. You knew it already. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, I have to make, make sure I mention that. Um, yeah, so thank you all for participating. Anybody else want to share what it was like to sing? I was getting excited. I wanted to do something even bigger. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It's, I think it's so lively. Like, it just makes you feel so alive. Mm -hmm. So I want to make it even bigger, I think, is what was happening for me. Yeah. Yeah, and that's beautiful because the improvisation shows your trust. Because mm -hmm. we can't really improvise unless we have that sense of self-trust. Mm -hmm. I remember that from when I was a classical musician going into mm -hmm. Oh, because I forgot to tell you all that. I played the cello at the same time I was rapping. Well, not the same time. <laughs> same age. Same age. And when I went to NYU, it was all about improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I was so anxious because I was so used to having something on the page. Mm -hmm. And I was forced to trust myself that I was going to be able to, what it was going to come out wasn't going to sound stupid. Or if it did, so what? So that's a great sign if you felt like you wanted to improvise. That's, that's you trusting trusting yourself. Well, I thought you were writing the song as you were sitting there, so I was like, oh, maybe I can add a little bit <laughs> to what she's doing. <laughs> it felt so organically, like, oh, we're just singing, what, what's happening here? Yep, yep, just kind of sprinkle it in, you know? Well, we're going to do another little experiential at the end, so there'll be some time and some space, space for that. So let me see what's next. Oh, finally, what does singing have to do with intimacy? That's why we're here. Um, so in the beginning, there was the word. That's a Bible verse, and it can mean so many different things. But the way I received it when I was, you know, creating this presentation and just as I've explored sound is that we enter the world with sound. And our first sound is we announce our arrival when we're crying as babies. So we come into the world like, ah, how did I get here? Get me back. Put me back. Put me back. No. Um, <laughs> That's what I said. No, I'm just kidding. Our first cry proclaims our birth and the life force flowing through us. So it's a declaration of life, right? And we make sounds instinctively, and we receive pleasure from playing with our lips, tongue, and vocal cords. And so babies have that self-soothing thing that they do when they're cooing and, and that kind of a thing. And so the mother's voice, and this is really big, is the most consistently available sound, and babies know that their mother's voice equates to safety and nurturing care. So infants and mothers reinforce attunement between themselves with gaze and gesture and vocal toning, and then it becomes almost like these duets between mother and baby, and that's one of the main ways that babies develop their sense of self in relation to an important other, right? So the earliest relational experiences create the underlying patterns with which we listen, speak, and sing throughout our lives. And so this forms the basis of attachment. Um, with that relationship between mom and baby. Um, conversely, infants whose experiences with a caregiver are negative or unpredictable or more likely to develop an insecure attachment. And that's a big part of my story that I didn't mention, but just having a, being an adult child of an alcoholic and having that dad not being emotionally present. And then, so I was predisposed already to fill that space with something, right? And I filled it with the stage. And then when the stage didn't work, you know, filled it with alcohol. 
and that didn't work, you know, fill it really relationships. So that insecure attachment is always about, you know, filling it with something. So um, the other thing, too, I remember there was a study, and I wish I remembered the name of it, um, something we learned in grad school. But the whole thing was that the baby would be crying, and the mom would be cooing and singing to the baby, right? And then she would just go flat. And the baby would go, ah, ah, ah. So the baby could feel. I mean, she didn't leave. She was still physically standing there. But she stopped the emotional interaction. She stopped connecting. And the baby started to panic. Because, of course, we know that the baby connects that to food, to like life, you know, the primal instincts. So this is a really important piece. Um, so singing builds intimacy with the self. We had a little experience of that. Um, when clients or even ourselves were able to be spontaneous, we can allow for the natural flow of impulses and can express ourselves from an authentic center of being. So healing can occur because we can connect with our true voices. And we can experience ourselves free from the tyranny of shoulds and oughts and access and release genuine feelings, thereby opening a channel to the self. That's a really great quote. What it means to me, though, is that when you're singing and when you're engaged in any kind of creative activity, you really aren't in your head, or at least ideally you're not in your head. Now, if you're performing and you have performance anxiety, and you're thinking about the gig and what's going to happen again, that's performance, then that puts you in your head. But if you're just singing like we just sang, right, there's a moment probably where hopefully you noticed you weren't thinking about anything. Mm -hmm. There was some moment in there where there was just you. And that's what happens. We are consciousness, and it's the mind that torments us. So when we are in that space of connecting to ourselves and we're out of the shoulds, we're out of the oughts, we're just out of the tyranny of the mind when we can just connect and sing and create. It happens when you paint, you know, it happens when you garden. That's what the whole basefulness, base for mindfulness is, you know. So that's what I feel like this means in terms of being freed from those shoulds and those oughts. So singing is integrating. Um, in which musical structure and composed text makes it possible for people to manage strong feelings. This is really getting into what I do as a music therapist. So when I do a group, let's just say for example, and I'm working with a group of people who are addicted or who have a mental illness, the song itself creates a structure for that process because a song has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So if we are writing a song together, if we're exploring an emotion, then you have this space of all of a sudden there's this safety and this magic happens with clients because they're expressing, because even though they may not be able to put it into words, there's the sense that they're being held. There's a container, there's a structure. And so song and singing creates that structure. So singing songs provides a way for people to safely release intense held energy while at the same time remaining in connection with one another. One of the things that happened with me when I was writing like an album, I was coming out of a really, um, I wouldn't call it a bad relationship because now I can look back and say that it was something for me to have, that I needed to learn. It was, like an, it was like right after I'd come into sobriety and it was that first relationship and that was the one that I found out that I had all of these abandonment issues. And it was like, oh my God, I thought I just had to stop drinking and that's all. And then, <laughs> and then it was like, no, you have a lot of work to do. And one of the ways I managed and, and actually healed from that relationship is that I wrote an EP, I wrote songs. And how many times have you heard artists write breakup albums? So there's something to that. There's a catharsis that happens when you are experiencing a very intense emotion and then you write a song and then you sing it. There's a transmutation that occurs. You know, one energy becomes something that was dense and constricted, becomes something that's expansive that then becomes inspiring for someone else. So that's what I feel like this is talking about. So you can safely release this intense held energy, but then you can still be in connection. So it's like a healthy way of moving through whatever that intense energy is and that's what I did with that album. I wrote it and once it was made I felt it was almost like it felt like it was complete after that, you know. Somatic mobilization is required in order to sing. So this requires the undoing, oh yeah, long held bodily retroflexions. Um, emotions are quickened through the aesthetics of music and this brings an individual's background forward. So vocal growth cannot be separated from personal growth. Absolutely without a doubt. Your vocal growth, your personal growth are interlinked. So it doesn't mean that if you're not singing, you're not healthy, you know? I mean, you could be, we could all be healthier, right? But it does mean if you connect to your voice, 
and you, you know, have that cultivation with your own voice, and then you can help your clients to do that, then that's going to actually link up with your personal growth, you know, how close you are with your own voice. So, um, so singing gives us, so how is it healing? Um, it gives us access to the invisible world. So imagery, memory, association. Um, sound can function as a bridge for unknown aspects of the self to cross over and make themselves known to us. So that's definitely true. Certain things come out in my client sessions in sound. And when I used to work in hospitals, I would have staff meetings with the psychologist and the verbal therapist. And I would say, oh, well, you know, Frank, you know, shared about his mother today. And he was like, what? Frank never talks about his mother. He won't talk about that. Well, it came in, it came through the music today, you know? So this, again, it's this disarming that happens through song and through sound that allows the ego to temporarily take a back seat so that real change can occur. It's a side door. Music is great for that. Singing promotes embodiment because of kind of what we've been talking about. You need to breathe to sing. And as soon as you start breathing, you're in your body, right? You get present. So that's one of the best parts about singing. Although plenty of rock stars sing out of body. They definitely do. There are plenty of you know, rock stars that are floating around you know, and dissociated. And so it's not necessary. Right, this is what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want anyone to walk away and say, that lady said that if you're singing, everyone who sings is embodied. No. But the healing component is that we can utilize it to become embodied if we use it in that, with that intention, right? So music also allows the image and the feelings associated with the complex to be channeled into a concrete form. So the needy part. You know, that's an example. So there's a part of me that maybe I'm dissociating myself from if I'm, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm ashamed of this part of me, which, of course, we know is like a shadow aspect or eventually goes into the shadow, right? So music and song would um, helps with that. When I did my vocal psychotherapy training, for example, one of the things that my, uh, and she was my therapist too, she would have me pick an object in her room. Like, you know, it'd be all these stuffed animals and like little figurines. And I would be struggling with the part of myself, like the part of me that's needy, for example, in that, in that relationship 15 years ago I was talking about. And she would say, OK, well, what is an object that you feel represents that part of you? Go pick that object. And I'd pick it. And then she'd say, OK, well, you can sing to it, as it, or about it. And it gives me the choice to choose my level of intimacy with that. Because if I'm singing to it, that's one level of intimacy. If I'm singing as it, well, that's, that's like the closest one, right? But then I could also choose to sing about it, where I'm narrating, mm -hmm. you know? So either way, I have this experience of being able to connect with this part of myself through song, you know, without it being something that um, I have to actually talk about, because that's when I get resistant. I'm very, very good at intellectualizing everything. So music doesn't allow me to do that, right? I have to actually face it. So the ego can then relate to a pre previously unknown aspect of the unconscious and then integrate it, which is what I think it's all really about, particularly with psychology, is that bringing what's in the unconscious into the conscious. The voice can serve as a transitional object. So singing is the most direct way to contact the inner child. So true. Singing naturally opens the heart and throat chakras, areas that are often closed in people who have unresolved issues around early trauma. So there is a whole other school of thought that is beyond music therapy and beyond psychology that goes into more of the sound healing, vibrational, energetic realms, which is absolutely worth investigating. So if this kind of piques your interest around that, I encourage you to go do some research on the throat chakra and the different chakra systems and how sound and vibration and even the seed syllables in the East, how they use the Om and the different kinds of Sanskrit and chants to be able to connect to those. I just couldn't put everything in today, but that's just as legitimate, I feel like, and just as helpful to have that component. This is more of like the psychotherapeutic, you know, clinical side of things. But you have these different types of vocal healing. Toning is what we're going to do. That's how we're going to actually wrap up. And the toning, to me, is probably one of the least threatening ways to sing. Because when we, when we do the activity, we'll see that it's the repetition of one single sound or syllable. And so you're basically choosing a vowel, and you're just using that vowel, and you're placing some sound on it. 
And the vowels are the essence of the sounds, and they are usually stretched out longer, so it sounds a little bit like a ooh or a. So it's really just about allowing sound to come forth versus actually singing. Um, one of the ways that toning can be used is you can, you can direct it to specific areas of the physical and emotional body. And there's a great book called Toning by Laurel Keyes. It actually came out in the 70s. So she was way, way, way ahead of her time or before her time. I never know which one it is. I think ahead. Um, and she talked about the power of toning, particularly as it relates to even how animals make sounds and how animals make sounds to relieve pressure and to, you know, to, to create space and, you know, to mate and, you know, just the use of sound. It's just very primal. It's very primal. So, so we'll have a, a chance to experience toning um, to close out. So chanting is a form of singing characterized by the repetition of short phrases of tones fairly narrow in range, often connected with some type of sacred text, um, oftentimes as a part of a ritual. And so we're all kind of familiar with chanting, and you know, that's like the Sanskrit and the Om, and you know, and what I've liked is that um, you know, Deepak Chopra and Oprah kind of came together a, year, a few years ago and started their meditation series, and it's, it's been great. I think they made meditation more accessible to people who maybe wouldn't be open to it, and the chanting, and the Sanskrit, and just, you know, and it all comes down to being able to bypass the mind, not spiritually bypass, but get past the ego and the chatter, right? So chanting, that's one of the things it does. You put an idea in your head, you have the sentence, it repeats, and all of a sudden your breath entrains to that, and then, boom, you're not in your head anymore, you know? And then again, when we're not in our heads, that's where all the magic can happen. So mantra, Sanskrit word meaning that which protects and purifies the mind. That's kind of what I was just saying. So the chief purpose of mantras, particularly in the East, is to expel negative tendencies embedded in the psychology. So like toning and chanting, mantras are sounded repetitively in a steady rhythm. And they can be sounded inwardly or outwardly, and it's useful because they can be set in motion at any time in any situation. So that means if you're sitting in your desk and you know you have a coworker, I'm sure we all love our coworkers, but you know, just in case you've got a coworker that's kind of, you know, you know, toxic or just having you're having experience, you're feeling triggered, the beautiful thing is with a mantra, you can just activate it in your own mind. No one will ever know that you're you're working with that. I have a really great story around that. This, I was on a boat on a catamaran in Brazil, and we were going between like uh, an island and the mainland. It was really, really choppy. Was not expecting it. Choppier than I've ever experienced. I mean, like the boat was like hitting concrete, and everybody else was vomiting, and I was so nervous that I was going to, and I was just getting very anxious. And so I put my feet up, and I started to, you know, I came up with my own little like poem or like a little chant. But then this other guy, he was the only one who wasn't, you know, sick. And he was standing at the door and he had something in his hand. And when I looked, I realized that he had the mala beads. And he was rolling each bead. And I saw his mouth and he was chanting and he was standing there cool as a cucumber. Like <laughs> everyone else is sick and he's just standing there with his beads. So I mean, it's really really something to the fact that you that he could have controlled his own body, you know, from from being sick with a mantra is, that's so powerful that it, that it can really do that, you know. So singing in groups, this is a cool transition because this has always been about, you know, intimacy with self. But intimacy with self is a bridge to being able to be intimate with others. So the idea of being able to build that intimacy with self is so that we can be in relationships in healthy ways, right? So I love this graphic. It says we met on eHarmony.com. <laughs> It's so cute. Um, so there's a sense of group support and group identity that develops when people sing together. It provides an opportunity for participants to experience strength and solace by simultaneously coordinating the emotions of a group of people. Anyone ever sing in a choir here? So you all know, right? The magic that can happen with that, right? I mean, as long as you don't have like a tyrant for a choir director, which I didn't, I had a great choir director, still have a great choir director. Um, so if you don't have that element where someone is so focused on like, you know, singing the right notes, then it's just about singing in a group. It can be really transformative. So Don Campbell had something to say about this. Um, group members singing together um, have been measured to have similar pulse rates, 
blood pressure, pupil dilation, and a study of people singing has shown that their brain wave patterns even synchronize. That's amazing. This is also known as somatic entrainment, right? Which makes sense. We, we're all connected, you know, entanglement. There's a lot of science around how we connect as human beings. But when we're singing together, this is the stuff that happens. Um, and then the anthrop anthropologist David Ad Attenborough investigated the uses of singing in pre-literate societies and in group activities of several other species. He found songs to be important coordinators of group effort, signifiers of readiness to mate, and a means to denote group boundaries or territory. So that's back to that kind of thing with animals. And of course, you know, dolphins who have their own song. You know, and I read once that once a dolphin meets another dolphin and gets their name, that they never forget it. It's always in their memory, and that dolphin has that, that song as that dolphin's name. So <coughs> dolphins and whales are the, are the, queen, the, the king and queens of, of, of sound and song in groups, right? Because they're very, they have these very complex family systems, and they're very sentient, you know? And, and sound and music is a part of how they connect with each other. So we're going to do our toning thing. It's not going to be that painful as that little girl. <laughs> Although that's kind of subjective. She could be a, you know, glee. Yeah, that could be like just I'm so happy I can't stop crying kind of a thing, you know. Um, so, so just a little bit more about toning. So toning functions as a catalyst for emotional release. It's a way of allowing the diseased part of the mind body to safely express itself. So all living beings make sound to release tension, increase strength. Unfortunately, we learn to cover our mouths when we laugh, and some people even suppress their sneeze. I've never been able to suppress my sneeze. But I've been around someone, and they're like, achoo! And I'm like, how do you sneeze so cute like that? My sneeze is like, achoo! But we are kind of you know, trained to make that it's not, it's not polite, right, to make a big sound, you know? Sound making is a way for the instinctual parts of our consciousness, which are often hidden or repressed, to directly communicate their healing messages through the body. So that's what sound is really there for, you know? And I'm, I love my yoga class that I go to because every now and then we'll get to the middle of the class and he's like, you know, take a breath and it's like, but instead of a rec regular exhale, we, you know, he's like, you know, do like the ha, ah, you know, with your tongue out, you know, and it's just like this intense exhale. And I can feel it. I can feel when that happens, how that sound moves, that energy that's pent up in my body, you know? So, um, so the self is revealed through the sound and the characteristics of the voice. Um, the process of finding one's own voice, one's own sound, is a metaphor for finding oneself. So I would definitely say that that would be like the thesis statement of the presentation, because that's what it's really all about. It's about being able to find self. I started with my story in terms of how I looked outside of myself. I gave my power away to a record company gave my power away to a stage, to a group of you know, people in the audience, to relationships. And so being able to find your own voice and being able to have access to it, again, you don't have to be some big performer. But just being able to have your own access to your voice is going to build that intimacy with self. And then once you have that, like almost like finding your home frequency, then your interaction with other people is going to totally change because you're moving from this grounded, very connected place. And so everything that happens in your interactions and your relationships are going to be a result of that way that you're moving, you know? So I think that's awesome. All right, so let's do our toning. Um, so the idea is singing on our own is a beautiful thing. And I hope that we'll all go home and like sing in the shower. <laughs> or maybe you'll sing on your way home in the car, which is the best because no one's listening. Um, but there's a beauty to singing together. And so with toning, um, you get to just choose a sound. It's going to be a vowel. You can choose um, ah, e, o, or u. Uh, anything that comes to you. Let it be really organic, you know. And then in terms of where you land on a note, let that be organic too, you know. Because the mind may try and say, oh, I have to sing high, you know, and oh, I have to sing low. Particularly when you hear other people's sounds, the mind will try and intervene, maybe and give a suggestion. It always likes to give us suggestions, right? Um, so if that happens, just notice it. We're not going to judge it. We're not going to try and stop it from happening. Just notice if the mind tries to give you a suggestion of what to do. And then once you get settled on your note, then you're going to close your eyes and just begin to notice how it feels to be surrounded with other people's notes. 
and notice how it feels to be in their sound. And if you feel compelled to find the note that they're on and to match them on that note, mm -hmm. go ahead. Feel what that feels like to sing the note of the person sitting next to you. And then if you feel like you want to go into a harmony with that person, you know, then feel what that feels like. Because it's all about connection and different varying levels of intimacy. If you're singing the same note, that's pretty intimate, right? And that can be healing to sing the same note as the person in your circle. You know, if you want to be able to feel the, uh, the experience of partnership, perhaps, then you do harmony, right? If you want to be supportive, then you pick the lower note. Hold it at the bottom, you know? So just play around with what you are compelled to do without, and see if you can do it really without judgment, in a sense that, you know, the, again, the mind likes to try and make, <laughs> it likes to just try and interfere. God bless it. But um, yeah, so I have a little sound thing here. When you hear the tempura, that, that means we'll stop, but we're just gonna do this without any like, guitar or anything, and we're just going to start. So again, um, if you want to close your eyes, I like closing my eyes doing it because then it just allows me to listen a little bit more, you know, without the distraction of, of looking. Um, so if you want to close your eyes, you can, and then just kind of start to make, take some deep breaths. If you want to feel grounded, you can put your feet on the ground. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to let a sound emerge whatever sound wants to emerge. It can be a, o, u, e. And then it can be anywhere in the scale. It could be a. Just find one that just feels right for you. And you don't have to stick with that. You can also play around with going to other notes and going to another sound. And so I'm just going to begin. And then when you feel compelled, without thinking and you just want to enter in, then you can just start. So I'm going to start. And then when you hear that little tempura, we'll just start to kind of let it slowly, slowly fade. So let's just take a few breaths together. Take a breath. So sometimes it ends naturally and organically. So just let the sound kind of surround you. Just a few more minutes, just one more minute. Anybody want to share what they noticed? Anything? Did you feel enveloped by sound at any point? Um, I was nervous at first to start because I was like, oh, I'm going to 
kind of linked with my whole story. <laughs> like, I kind of like, <laughs> like, like, oh gosh. But then um, once I got into the rhythm, I kind of let go of that voice. I think it was that voice that was holding me back from like, oh, you know, like that fear mm -hmm. of embarrassment. Like, what if I sound like, like off? But then I just kind of just jumped and just let myself into the moment. And then I felt more free doing that. Oh, good. That was brave. This is very intimate. Yeah. Anybody else want to share what it was like? Anyone else felt nervous about it? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And the sing singing was easier than this. Too. Wow, OK. There's something, I don't know, easier than that. The guitar is just fun, and this one's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the girl with the guitar. No. <laughs> That's interesting. And I definitely felt like I had to match everyone. Like I could increase my volume. Uh, it just felt like I don't want to be the loud one now. And mm -hmm. There was all sorts of sort of judgment and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting too because with the songs we were singing the same thing, right? So it was uniform. You know, we were repeating back, and yeah, this is a little bit more you know fluid. It's a little bit more abstract. You know, which if you use this technique with your clients, because by the way, this is one that you can use with your clients mm -hmm. because you don't have to be a music therapist to tone, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this is something to remember. Like if you have a group of people that need structure, that this would not, that maybe this is not good, right? Because there's not a lot of containment mm -hmm. in the, you know, oh, just sing whatever note you want and see where it lands, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, that, but you may have groups or clients where you're specifically working on building intimacy where maybe you just do this toning with a client and see what their tolerance level is of whether they can handle you singing the same note as them. Because for you, that was, you preferred that. But for some people, that feels really close where it's like, oh my God, we're singing the same note. We're like the same, we're the same. You know, it's too close, you know. And you can kind of play around with that um, in that way because some people are not going to be able to do it and then conversely when you are exploring intimacy in a group I mean one of my think favorite things I say to my clients is I have one client she just wants to be in a relationship so bad and I'm like you know what I feel you but that's when all the work that's when all your stuff's gonna come up <laughs> when you get into a relationship <laughs> it's not it's not like where you land you know you're like oh I'm in a relationship who I've arrived finally you know no that's just a nut uh -huh. I call a relationship a spiritual practice because it's, it's easier to me at times in my life to have just been on my cushion. When I was on my cushion meditating, it's easy, right? It's just me. Same thing with singing. When it's just you, there, it may not be easy, but it's just you. As Soon as you get into a group and you begin to sing, that's when all of our stuff begins to come up. And that's good because guess what? We're clinicians, we wanna grow, and we want our clients to grow. So you want to be able to put things in place where you get information. So this is a good way in a group where if you want to do some group dynamics and do some assessment with some clients, do toning. You'll find out very quickly what people's levels of tolerance are, you know. You know so much experience, right? Mm -hmm. Teaches the sound technique. He calls it Vu. Have you ever seen No, I've never heard. No. Yeah. So um, you take a deep breath and then you say Vu until there's absolutely no breath left. That's the goal. Oh, wow. And then you take another deep breath and you go. So uh, he's been using this with veterans, with any tra trauma survivors. I mean, he's not calling it toning. I think he says it's maybe Buddhist mm -hmm. sound te healing technique. I can't remember, but we use it with our clients in my class. Oh, that's great. So um, it, it reminds me a little bit of that, but this one has a bit more structure so that the clients know what the sound and when to end because you explain to them that the goal of the breathing is not the inhaling, but the exhaling. Mm -hmm. and because when you're sounding woo until you have no breath left, you're really completely exhaling all the air out. Mm -hmm. and, and then they start feeling the vibration here in their throat, in mm -hmm. their face, and it's, it's, it's pretty calming. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because something shifts when you put a consonant in front of a vowel. That's the other thing that's different. We were just doing vowels. But when you add a V, mm -hmm. that is stimulating. Mm -hmm. 
vu, and like even just the vu, or even if you go e or z, like that e, you're gonna feel that right here, you know. So that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's another way you can add some adjustments or kind of do that with your clients is play around with what it's like to do a consonant in front, which ones are stimulating, which ones are overstimulating, which ones are calming, because some are calming and some aren't. You know, like hum is really beautiful and calming. That's the one they use for the heart chakra a lot of, you know, hum, hum. Any kind of ah, la, ma, any of those are good. Does anybody, I wanted to leave time for questions. Um, hopefully, it's not a lot of time, but that's my contact info, just in case you want it. Um, I do private practice, workshops, retreats. Um, I've been wanting to do a retreat for a while. I haven't done one in a long time, so if you're interested in that, you can contact me. Um, referrals for clients that are really resistant to talking and to anything that, you know, feels ther like they're, they're being therapized, this is really, really great. So, you know, you can contact me around that.